Hello and welcome to Art Show. I'm Craig Stover and today I have with me Eileen Neff. Hey Eileen, how are you today? Hi Craig, I'm good. Great to have you on the show. So I want to start out sharing a few of your pictures for those people who might be unaware of the kind of work that you do. Um, hold on. There we go. Um, so I'm hoping that you could tell me just a little bit about these. What I did is I went online and I, I, I picked a few pieces that I thought were outstanding. Um, hopefully you can you can see this. Uh, tell me about this particular one. Okay. Um, well, this is um, uh, the visit is the black and white um with the green bush um image that's sitting on top of uh my bird book collection in my studio mm -hmm. and i decided this um configuration needed to be an image itself um this was in an exhibition i had in new york at bruce silverstein in 2014 i think it was and um, you know, it, it conflates time for me. Uh, the visit was a much earlier image when I was working in black and white and doing some hand painting, which is how that was made. Uh, and since the computer, you know, color comes along and um, I just was bringing it along for uh, the work that I was doing there. And the idea of the image within the image is something that interests me in general. The idea that you called this the visit and the picture, I, I, to me, this this put a smile on my face. It it was I I saw it as funny. Well, um, the visit, uh, I mean, it is funny. the 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 black and white image on its own had a. Uh, a bit of humor, which you're picking up on. Uh, the, the window, that black hole in the window is open. So um, the bush could come in. It's like my annunciation. Right. <laughs> I love that it's got that like storyline in it. And it's got, the more yes. you look at it, the more of the story fills in for itself. It, and I don't find a lot of artwork that's, that, you know, puts a smile on my face that has that sort of humor to it. But You've well, made the, this bush alive. <laughs> the, the whole humor question is interesting to me because I I tend to go there when I'm walking around, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't always bring it to my work. So when I do, I'm always glad to see it. Um, <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, it's this subtle. It's not um, a ha-ha moment, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, so, something slyer is going on. That's what I, I like I'm about glad it. Glad you responded to it. Yeah. So I've, I've switched over to another piece. Um, so this is from, um, um, from the first exhibition I did at the Bridget Mayer Gallery, and this is um, two works that go together, and they are actually the same image of a cloud. The image I turned into a series of postcards. It's one single image that I broke up and put in this postcard rack. It's called A Cloud and Its Clouds. It's hard to see its clouds. There are smaller clouds accompanying the larger cloud. And then I, um, in the book, it's a little hard to see at this um, size. But the image is slightly moved off of the page as if the cloud is making its way to be elsewhere. I like the, the idea of a cloud as a commodity. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, and for me, I mean, I think, you know, I like the idea of presentation and, and the questions involved in display and presentation. And so the idea of two different presentations for the same image it is makes me mm -hmm. very happy. yeah mar I, the, the idea of marketing nature in different products I, it, well, the piece I, work I, I wouldn't use that language but i know what you mean <laughs> yeah and then uh, this one i had to bring forward this was a personal favorite of mine i've always liked this particular piece thank you um so this is um Cezanne's 
They saw in stream. Stream, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, from a mountain, a bed, and a chair, which was a very large installation I did at both the ICA here in Philadelphia and also at Artist Space in New York. And um, it involved um, a residency at the time at the fabric workshop. A lot of things were humming and falling into place. And it followed um, a residency that I was lucky to have had in the south of France at a place called the Chateau de la Napoule. And I had a car there and basically just drove around the landscape to see what I could see. And about a week before I left my five week residency, I um, remembered that Cezanne's Mont Saint Victoire was not so far. So I took the ride, it was about an hour and a half away, and was totally knocked out by seeing it. And um, I went back every day for the rest of the week. And uh, thinking that I had missed something, I would always start at the same place. So uh -huh. I, never, I never got around the mountain. And it was um, a Thursday or some day, the only day when um, his studio was closed. And so I couldn't get in there. But I when I came back home. I found images, of course, of the studio and did um, also realized how I had been involved with Cezanne as a young girl and had read John Raywald's biography, which I had totally forgotten about. It was like all these things in my pocket were you know, stirred up and talking to me again. I brought back dirt, which you're not supposed to do, which is in that um, on the floor beyond okay. us from the mountain. And it really became an homage. And there are several other parts to it, um, to his obsession uh, with the, the object, you know, of, of the, of his vision. I mean, he was born at the foot of the mountain and died on the mountain. And yeah, uh, there's so, so much to unpack in this. this it, piece. It is. And so it's about him and his experience. And there's a lot that's playing off of the studio, but it's also about every artist's ultimate obsessive attachment. You go to bed with your idea and you wake up with it. And of mm -hmm. course, there's, you know, other ways to read that mountain in the bed as well. So um, where uh, is this piece currently? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it's <laughs> in the collection of the fabric workshop. OK. All right. right. Good. Because that's that's definitely a thinker piece, something that you, I think I would need to mull over. I need more time to really start deciphering it. Right. Um, so I saw this piece and what you can't really see is the frame that you've constructed because it it bends at the top there to sit on top of these these drawers um tell, tell me a little bit about this piece because this is a it's got more it makes me it gives me more questions than it does answers well i'm actually remembering its title it was called um it is called before fiction and um there is a uh the the top of the photographic chest of drawers um, is is actual physical and there is a bent empty frame that you mentioned and uh, the top angles back to the wall and the little composition book on the left here on its right um, is cut and at an angle to line up with um, the top of the table or the perspective of the table and um, I mean, one thing I should say when I first uh, turned to photography, uh, it was not my formal training. I think because it wasn't, I felt a great deal of freedom in terms of what the work could be. And um, I was very naturally drawn to the space between a flat image and an image in the world. Mm -hmm. So questions of representation could move in and out of that space. And I think this is a very early example of that, which continues to interest me. 
I've always liked how you use photography as a tool, uh, rather not necessarily as a as a as an end product. Um, I like I, I've always admired that in your work. So the, here's a here's a great example where you're using photography, but clearly it's only just as a source material. Like it's, you're you're referencing it, but then you're you're playing with it. Um, right. Why that? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm actually doing something I don't usually do in, in this, but I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> the The parts come from the bands of light, um, the eastern wall in my studio, and I live and work in the same space. And over the years, I have been um, very sensitive to the summer solstice, which is the only time that the um, sun actually um, comes right into my space um, because it is north enough in the sky while it's setting. And it appears on, of course, setting in the west, it appears on my eastern wall and it sort of marches across the wall. So over time, I've been putting things um, in its track and to see what I could see. And the, the more straightforward images, I, I think you could see that. In fact, I've flipped them, um, well, in a couple of different ways, but um, while well, I flip them horizontally, the bands are really vertical and the landscape that I had put on the wall was vertical. In, in other words, it was already disoriented. I don't know if you could follow that. I so got it. The bands of light, um, right, were also lined up with it. And then, of course, in the computer, I was free to do whatever I wanted with it. Usually, and if you saw the other works that accompany this, it's in the uh, summer solstice 2022. Um, I'm much more straightforward in my presentations and count on cropping, which I think is as common as that word is, I think it's a magical tool because it eliminates all of the mm -hmm. noise around and suddenly, you know, something uh, much more magical seems to happen. Right. And that's usually enough for me. But in this case, um, I know this is what you can do in Photoshop. And I was just having my way with it and, and did it. And this is, of course, an example of the right. more straightforward uh, presentation. And that's just uh, uh, the back of an empty frame that has its own drawing in the wood grain, which I liked, and it's just sitting on top of uh, empty canvas. And yeah. And there it is. So that's that's the the sun um, setting that I was talking about. So in this, the reason I chose, I had a particular question about this particular one. I know that you sometimes reference other artists uh, in your work, like the Cezanne piece. Is the back of this picture also of reference to other artists? Because I can immediately I start thinking of Philip Gust and De Chirico and like a whole bunch of other artists that talk about them, oh, even Jasper no, Johns. What is this? Really. No, 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 it, no. Okay. I mean, to me, I see a reference to landscape that's in the wood grain. And right. the wood, of course, comes from the landscape and on and on. But I, I had no other artists in mind. Okay. Had to ask that because I, I saw the work and I, it, I I mean the work you know it has its own resonance for whoever is viewing it so right yeah different viewers different questions so let let me start by uh, asking you a question I always uh, love to ask artists uh, what was your first memory uh, of being exposed to art do you have a first thing that really sort of jolted you. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, it's more complicated than that. Um, I think um, I know <laughs> that my um, experience and my life in visual art, which it's been, um, uh, I've really entered through a side door 
And I was, um, while I always liked making art, I was told that drawing and napping were my favorite activities in kindergarten, which sounds right. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I remember my dad taking me to Fleischer Art Memorial for classes as a young girl. Um, but I still don't think I registered seeing art, although I'm sure I did. And my dad, who took us, my brother and I, to lots of places, was also, um, he had a great affection for nature based on his um, earlier life as a hiker. Um, and so we often went to parks. And I remember um, that I, I don't have a specific memory of going to the art museum with him, although I'm sure I did. But I do remember going to the Fairmount Waterworks, which were an aquarium at the time, and seeing fish there and how exciting that was. So I'm sure we were in the museum. But again, um, and I think my dad had a lot to do with it. So I, on one hand, I was nurturing my own attachment to making art and those pleasures. But I was really very plugged into the natural world because of him. He would wake me every Sunday morning to go hiking through Pennypack Park, which I, you know, wasn't such a great idea as I was getting a little older, but um, it it proved to be very central to who I am and what I care about. So it was an enormous gift. And um, again, I, you know, if I start really trying to think about your question, um, I have, I have specific memories of being jolted, but I was much older and my first formal study was in literature. I don't know if you ran hmm, across that's that. That's quite interesting. But well, I, you know, I find it, I find it very interesting that you start, you're, you're really going down the path of the nature and behind you, I'm looking at three birds. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's definitely you're on the right path, that connection to it. So I, I'm it's sort of where I live. Right. <laughs> so, so speed yeah. me up a little bit. Tell me about at what point did you realize that becoming an artist could was a path for you that you wanted okay. to follow? So I uh, the first time I went to college, <laughs> okay. uh, my first degree, my formal education was in literature. I got a degree in English at Temple University. But I spent all of my free time in the main campus art department and with Neil Kosh, who's no longer with us. And that was, you know, very pivotal. But again, it wasn't my main focus, but it was always there. And then I remember taking some evening classes, a uh, painting class with Jimmy Luters at PAFA and an Love evening Luters. class and um, things like that. And after a couple of years, I decided, I, and again, I don't know, you know, nothing really hit me over the head, but it didn't go away. And maybe I just needed to be back in school. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> I decided um, to apply to what was then Philadelphia College of Art. And they actually waived my foundation year because of all the courses I had taken at Temple. Okay, all right. Kind of great. And then I basically uh, took painting and drawing and art history um, and um, for three years and got a BFA in painting and then went directly to Tyler for an MFA in painting. How much of your background in the literature studies does did that do you do you think that that played a role in the kind of work that you do? It's totally leading the way and still with me. Yeah, I I was very attached to poetry as a young girl. I would memorize poems, and when I was on hall duty, do you know what hall duty yes, is? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm not that young. <laughs> I don't know so, why I was on hall duty. You know? <laughs> so, so are you? Are you a voracious reader? No. No. 
but I am, I read poetry and I'm, I have some poets who have come along with me and they're central to my thinking and what I do, okay. but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call me a voracious reader. You know, I'm okay. still teaching. So there, there are also things that I need to keep up with, you okay. know, to, um, not be living in my own past only <laughs> so uh which is good for me you yeah. know and it keeps me um paying attention to a lot of things and i i have so much that if some of it's attached to my work i mean actually a lot of it is that i that i need to be reading um that it's all it's all work related i i hardly read anything that's not tied to what i'm doing <laughs> so 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 tell me a little bit about your creative process. So you go into the studio and are you are you the kind of artist that you've got tons of ideas or maybe you have just one idea or maybe you have no ideas and you you know you you play with materials. What what's your normal modus operandi? Well, I think it goes in more than one direction. So it's not like one way. And again, living in the studio has its own rewards, you know, and, and influences things um, quite a bit. Um, so for instance, um, as a marker, I mean, for years now, this, this summer solstice has been um, something I know that happens yearly. So I prepare for it. I think what will I want to put in the sun's path this year? And for some reason, I decided I wanted a tree this year. Uh -huh. So I went to Curtis Arboretum, you know, in the spring before the sun came to visit me. And um, and I found a tree that it, it's taken me a long time to properly identify. I'm pretty sure it's a persimmon. Uh -huh. uh, it's, a, it's a great <clears throat> handsomely barked tree and basically I have a nine foot tree now in the studio um just the just the trunk okay and, who uh, doesn't from, right <laughs> um, from the floor to the ceiling uh -huh. and, and but what's interesting and I think um uh, addresses your question about the studio practice is you know of course I wanted to see the sun moving across it and was all set to photograph that, but if you remember this past summer was very strange mm -hmm. um, weather wise and I didn't have like a daily um, proper sunsets on my eastern wall, <laughs> so other things started to happen and. Um, so pieces of the tree started joining with other pieces of my work. Um, I, I went back for another visit to have another look and gather some leaves um, one day. And I um, put them in my shirt pocket. And when I got back, it was very hot. And I decided I needed a shower. And I also decided I'd throw all my clothes in the washer. And I forgot about the leaves. And so I'm not until they came out of the dryer. Mm -hmm. And I had a pocket full of <laughs> right. scraps, leaf scraps. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, and I took a photograph of them, which I love. Uh-huh. OK. <laughs> You know, it's about paying attention yeah, yeah. To, to what happens to happen. So I have, you know, the work leads the way. And then I try to follow with as much attention to what doesn't happen and what yeah. does happen as I can. That's a great answer because it really, every once in a while, an artist will tell me something and it transforms my understanding of their work. So the idea that you said that you... You knew the sunlight was coming. You were trying to figure out an object for it. I mean, that was that's pure gold for me because it really gives me an opening in, into the the kind of stuff you do. I'm I'm curious when you sort of look back at your Oviera work, do you feel like the work has changed over the years? And if so, has it has it been a gradual slide as a change? Usually, there is change for an artist, and I've seen it in the work. Uh, or have there been breaks where you've 
it just changed over. I think I'm circling around something. Okay. All right. I've thought, <laughs> I've thought about this only because every once in a while I make something and then I realize I've made something very like it many years before that I hadn't mm -hmm. remembered. Mm -hmm. And I think I think if you're lucky, you have a couple or a few ideas. Yeah, right. And that you move around them to try the best way to, you know, bring them forward. Well, so saying, circling I, around something is, is that's probably the name of your next show, because I think that's perfect to describe well, that. I think it's what we do or how I'm feeling um my own time here uh, that that's what it feels like and not and i mean hopefully you know the circles are getting larger and more embracing but they're mm. still revisiting along right. the way and so i it's not a straight line heading somewhere that's for sure yeah i'm curious about your your uh your methodology when you're working, do you ever find that you're working on a piece and um, do you keep working on it until it works for you? Or do you ever, are there pieces that you give up on just like forget it or? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, with in the computer, you know, that's another world. Um, yeah, there are lots of files that I don't, uh, I might print out a little print to see myself, but don't do anything with. So there's a natural editing process, I think, that's just sort of thing. built when, in. Yeah. When you're in your studio, do you have, and say you're about to go to work and you're in your studio, do you have any studio rituals that you like to do? So I'll give you an example. I, I asked this the other day and the artist said, well, I have to like clean my studio before I work because she destroys it each time and then leaves it. And another artist told me, well, they need a half a, you know, a cup of tea and a half a sandwich or something. Is you do anything like that or you just go in and go? No, I don't have any rituals. I mean, I'll think about it now. Maybe I'm unaware of them. <laughs> right. I, just, I know I have breakfast first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Can't can't make but, art on an empty stomach. That's, that's at the start of any day. <laughs> yeah. So not, not, not really. And again, I'm, you know, just wanting to be open to what triggers how yeah. we'll proceed. And it also has to do with what I left the night before. Mm -hmm. I've also started working late at night again, which is something I had stopped for a while. It was how I worked for a long time, but I I feel like that's coming back. I don't know what that means. Why did you stop working late at night? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I, just going I, with the flow. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just realized at some point I, I wasn't that energized for working at night, but I, I am again, and there's a lot going on in the studio and there are other projects. So mm -hmm. it might just be the extra energy from, you know, what's happening. Well, it's kind of interesting that you talk about working at night, but prior to this, we were discussing you're waiting for the sunshine to come in. Well, that's just for that project. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. I've learned a lot. I've got one final question for you question I ask all artists. Uh, simple question. What does making art do for you? Oh, it's just the way it is. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, it, I mean ideally, um, the kind of uh, heightened attention that uh, it affords is, is you know, a, a really good place to be. And I value that. I also um, ideally would like to think that um, my work can instigate that kind of response in the viewer. So there's some spillage of that onto how, you know, the work could be experienced. So, um, yeah, and it's about presence and, and it being... Um, um, finely tuned at, at that moment i find that that question people that if they're not prepared for it and then they get the answer 
comes clearer and clearer as they keep talking. And I thought, oh yeah, that's right. That's how that works. So I, I can't thank you enough for coming by today to talk to me about oh, your work. Um, now, you know, just the little nuggets that you gave me, I now have like 20 more questions I need to ask. Um, I really, really appreciate it though. And I also appreciate everybody for tuning in today to watch our show, with Eileen. If you have any questions, uh, I will be putting Eileen's website uh, on this video, but you can always put something in the comments section. If I don't know it, I can pass it on. Uh, we obviously uh, love it when you like, share, and subscribe. That really helps uh, energize us. So again, Eileen, thank you very much for coming thank by you, today. Fred. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. So, I appreciate and thanks everybody for tuning in. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.